Data breaches? Ransomware? Should you be concerned? You bet you should. This is Mac Voices. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Smile, the makers of PDF Pen and PDF Pen Pro. PDF editing for your Mac, iPhone, and iPad. Find out more at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, it seems like right now you can't turn on the TV, the radio, pick up a magazine, go online to your favorite website without hearing something about ransomware, malware. There's a lot of paranoia out there, um, and some of it's justified. Maybe some of it isn't. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today from someone who actually does uh, this stuff. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Paul Ducklin. He is a principal research scientist with uh, Sophos, the security software company. Paul, welcome to Mac Voices. It's great to have you. It's lovely to be here, Chuck. Uh, just to be absolutely clear, when you say I do this stuff, uh, well, to be to be very precise, I do against it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, it's, yes. It's like when people say, what do you do? Oh, I work with vi- computer viruses. And they go, you do mean antivirus, right? Anti-phishing, anti-spam, anti-the hackers. And yes, that's what Sophos is all about. Basically, yeah. to protect people from the effects of cybercrime. Yeah, we did not bail Paul out of jail to talk to you. So that's the good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, Paul's one of the good guys. Paul's one of the good guys. Paul, you heard my introduction. And, you know, it, it strikes me that um, that the, the malware, the viruses, everything has sort of changed. The messaging about it has changed. Uh, right now, it seems like ransomware is the thing that it, it's the boogeyman. It's, you know, it's the big bad. And I'm wondering how, how accurate that is. I mean, is there a reason we should be more afra- afraid of ransomware? Is everything else out there still as much of a threat as it has been? Or is it just the bad guys are looking for a bigger payoff uh, through ransomware? Chuck, I think one of the big problems when it comes to the evolution of cybercrime and cyber threats is you very rarely leave the past behind. And it's not as though, oh, well, spyware's gone away and phishing's gone away. It's all ransomware now. It's like, yes, we have ransomware. Yes, this is a clear and present danger with potential multi-million dollar extortion demands at the end of it. But it hasn't replaced. It's merely added to all of the stuff that's been going on for years and years and years. And generally, to get rid of any particular specific sort of malware threat, requires some kind of technological change. For example, you don't have to worry about computer viruses that spread on floppy disks anymore, not on a Mac, not on Windows. And the reason is not that that kind of virus was unsuccessful. It's just that by good fortune, you don't get floppy disks anymore. And sometimes, sadly, that's what it boils down to. So as you say, ransomware feels like that clear and present danger. What was it? Is it... JBS, the meat people, just said, oh, yeah, we decided we pay up $11 million. We had Colonial Pipeline admitted they paid $4.4 million. They kind of, I think they figured, well, we'll pay the money. Maybe it'll speed up recovery. Turns out that not only did it cost them $4.4 million, seems they got ripped off as well (laughs) because the decryption tool didn't work. You can understand why cybercrime like that gets the big news. But in amongst all of that, you need to remember that for most of these ransomware crooks, or for many of them, the ransomware comes at the end. And they may have been in your network for days, weeks, or even months before, having a look around, stealing data, recovering passwords, looking for people's dates of birth, driving licenses on record, social security numbers, contents of emails, all of that stuff. And, you know, once they've got all of that data that they're interested in, it's almost as though, well, let's go for the ransomware now. Let's 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 finish with a bang, not with a whimper. So the ransomware is, it's great if it takes ransomware to wake people up to take cybercrime seriously and cyber threat seriously. But if you focus on ransomware and take your eyes off everything else, I think you're doing yourself 
and your user community a massive disservice. So you bring up an interesting point, and we see this sometimes in the media coverage, um, very occasionally, and frankly, probably more in the tech tech uh, press than the the general press, about how um, the, the bad guys have been into a system for, as you say, weeks, months, maybe longer, and then all of a sudden they decide to do something, whether it's you know the the the, the obvious ransomware as you described, or something more. I don't. Not sure there is anything more nefarious, but you understand what I'm saying, yeah. and and that's that can be a little scary um, because that means that if they if they successfully breach the system, then even if you are a secure user and and you try to behave yourself and do everything right, they can still be in there obtaining the information on you as a user and on the company as a whole. Yes, yeah, so and that's why data breach notifications, which in many jurisdictions are now mandatory you know the 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 the, uh, the legislatures in very many countries have said you know this sweeping data breaches under the carpet not acceptable if you've had a breach like in, in the uk for example you have 72 hours to report it to the privacy commission information commissioner's office and then they will decide what you need to do next they might say look we want to keep this quiet because we'll get investigators in but generally the idea is you fess up quickly you decide what you're going to tell your users and you tell them speedily so they can do something about it and you'll probably know that in many decent breach notifications where the company isn't being glib where they don't start with those ridiculous words your security is very important to us so important that we had a massive data breach you know no one believes that so don't bother saying it but even when companies come out and say look we have to apologize there's been a giant disaster what we can't do right now is tell you just how bad it was and that i think is a huge problem with today's if you like patience based cyber threats, that the crooks aren't just writing a virus which can spread by itself, letting it go and reaping their ill-gotten gains that way. They're going in with what we now refer to as human-led attacks, where there are people actually doing the work. So it's not like they're programs pretending to be users. They are users. They've wheedled their way into your network by foul means. They've promoted themselves to system administrators. They've mapped out your network. In some cases, they end up knowing your network better than you do. They found that cupboard under the stairs that everyone else forgot about, that server with the with the backups on that you just assumed was working fine. And so what that means is you know, when a breach happens, usually that's because something got noticed. Oh, this data, which is on that server, suddenly appeared in public. That shouldn't have happened. So you know some of what's gone on, but when you go and investigate, it's really hard to know what didn't happen. Because as we all know, sort of proving a negative is very difficult. And that's why a lot of companies who are trying to do the right thing do start off their breach notifications by saying, we're really sorry, something bad happened. You'll have to give us a few more days before we know just how bad it is. In the meantime, we had to reset everybody's passwords, or you know, or everybody needs to go and look at their credit card balances, even though we don't think the crooks got the credit card numbers. We're not yet sure. And of course, if the crooks have been in your system for all that time, how do you know that you can believe your logs at all? And I guess that's the big problem, is it's dealing with cyber threats these days, whatever operating system you're on. It's not about, oh, scan for malware. Oh, look, we found it. Remove it. Tick it off. Write it on the list. Pat self on back. Go back into battle again. It's almost as though when you notice that something bad has happened, that's the sign that you need to start doing a whole load of investigation to find out whether it was a little bit bad or a lot bad. I, I want to be careful with this question because I, it, it's it's it is frankly I think a little dangerous, but there I think there's a natural tendency for me as a user, you as a user, to get a notification that a company's data has been breached, um, a, a major retailer or something of that nature, and then to blame them for well, gee, it, this is this security thing. I mean, you should have paid somebody. You should have really done a better job and now I'm inconvenienced I'm at risk is that is that fair I mean I, I know in some cases obviously because 
I've seen cases where people are very, very, very cavalier about security. But is that a fair gut level reaction when you're talking about a major company who obviously understands the risks and has taken steps, at least what they thought were adequate steps? That really is a an important question, maybe you know the the sixty four thousand dollar question when it comes to a data breach. I think that Chuck, the, the simple the simple bottom line to it all is that a data breach or a ransomware attack or something where some customer's data probably got compromised is never a good look. If you have to put out a data breach notification, nobody is ever going to email you back and say, hey, well done. <laughs> you know, uh, so I think, you know, when when it when it comes to the a company getting hacked, it shouldn't happen. You are entitled to feel aggrieved if you are a customer of that company. But to my mind, what they do next is just as important, possibly more important. And to be honest, I've had cases where I've had notification from a company saying, hey, we've had a breach. And like you said, it was it was all very cavalier and hey, we, we don't care. We take your security seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't think anything bad happened. Carry on. We'll give you a year's free credit monitoring if you really, really want it. But we're actually super clever and it won't happen again. And you have to believe us. I think, you know what? I'm going to take my business somewhere else. That doesn't sit well with me. I feel sorry for them that they got hacked, even though actually it's to my detriment. But they collected my data. They promised me they'd look after it. They owe it to me when they haven't fulfilled that promise to do something to rebuild my confidence and my trust. And so a company that has had a breach and does exactly the opposite, that comes out and is frank, reacts promptly, doesn't tell me what I want to hear, but instead tells me what I need to know. And even if they make me wait a while, then comes up with an explanation that said, this is what happened. This is what we've done. And this is why we think what we have done will stop this repeating. I would be inclined to trust a company like that again, and I would be inclined to keep my business for them because I kind of feel like they've learned the lesson properly and that I can believe what they're saying. So I think that, you know there is no fixed answer to your question. And I think nobody wants a breach. And obviously your faith in a company that gets breached, that had your data and promised it wouldn't lose it, is going to be dented. Whether or not that dent means you should go, right, I'm closing my account and moving someone else, somewhere else, or it means that you think about what they've said and decide, you know what, I think they've come out of this better, stronger, more resilient, and I'm going to keep trusting them. Well, it, it all depends on how they respond. And like you said, it's, it's surprisingly easy to tell the difference, isn't it? The tone of voice in many of these breach notifications, you can just read a few sentences and you kind of get the feeling whether this is just somebody being glib or a company genuinely trying to make it better. You make a, a number of good points in there. Because <clears throat> um, I too, I've seen both kinds of notices. There is an appeal, and I guess I've, I think maybe a little bit different than some people, but there's an appeal to staying with that company if they are taking steps, and as you said, are being diligent about it, because now they have been burned. And so once you touch the stove, you're probably not going to touch it again nearly as quickly, um, as, as opposed to saying, okay, you you burned me, and now I'm going to go over here to this other company who I have no experience with and don't know what their policies are. So I, I like I like the way you're you're talking and thinking about that because I think that there is that knee jerk reaction and you really have to gauge your own response before you take action. Yes, and I do think it's very often obvious whether the company has just got some PR person to come up with words or whether what you're reading or hearing is really management and technical people coming through with a little bit of emotional connection and a lot of intellectual excellence trying to do better next time. I think that a lot of, in a lot of breach notifications, it sort of speaks for itself. For example, you know, the, we take your security seriously. If you open a breach notification with words like that, it's almost like a contradiction in terms. 
what you should be saying is we wish we had taken it seriously enough before. We will now, and we're really sorry. If you say that and really mean it, that's way better than pretending that, oh, well, this is the worst thing in the world. And of course, every company, no company wants to admit that it fell for the oldest trick in the book. So it's always got to be the most sophisticated hackers and the most devastatingly well-funded nation state, this, that, and the other, and the most advanced persistent threat. Well, occasionally it might be. But the point is that most companies that get hacked get hacked at least in part because perhaps something as simple as might be as something as simple as one person making an innocent mistake that you kind of think you know what i didn't make that mistake but i don't put it past me like clicking on a believable phishing email trying to act to help somebody that they thought was a colleague whose email account had been hacked we all know that it could happen to us and if we respect that and think about how the company is responding so i think if they're easy on the hyperbole if they don't tell you how clever they were but how they wish to learn to be clever in future if they don't over exaggerate the severity of the threat then i think you can judge that they probably are trying to learn and another thing that you know if, if you're thinking about how to write a data breach notification then don't don't tell me silly things like oh well you don't have to worry because we don't think the crooks got your credit card number they got your name your date of birth your social security number your home address your personal phone number your national insurance number whatever it is all of that stuff but they didn't get your credit card number don't bother telling me that i can go to the bank tomorrow and get a new credit card it'll have a new number on it i've got legal cover for unauthorized transactions. I can get a new credit card easily. It's annoying. I don't want to have to do it, but I can do it and I've done it before. What I can't easily do is change my name, move house, get a new social security number. That's very complicated indeed, although I believe it is now technically possible. And that I can never change my date of birth. My mother's maiden name will always be the same. So I think the most important thing is just don't be glib in what you're trying to tell somebody when something bad has happened. Tell them what they need to know with some practical tips that they can go out right now to help themselves in future. Even if those tips seem really obvious, even if they seem like things you should have told them a year ago, the more you help them, I think the better they'll like you in future. But if you just try and say, oh, well, we got hacked, but you know what, it doesn't really matter. You better come up with the proof for that. You better really have found that through diligence rather than just saying it in the email you send me afterwards. Because otherwise we just get what people call breach fatigue, don't we? Where you go, oh, here's another one. Oh, well, another one got my email address, click, forget it. Which is rather a sad state of affairs, really. But I, I know I've had that reaction at times is that at some point you think, okay, there's not much I can do about it. So thank you for letting me know that you screwed up. But yeah, I, you know, I, am I going to go and change my email address every single, or excuse me, my password to my email address every single time um, that someone breaches? Well, I know I should, um, but you're right. You know, the, the car is on fire and the lawn has to be mowed and I've got other things to do and people overlook it, unfortunately. Yes, uh, there have been some surveys recently about the speed with which people change their passwords after they've had a data breach notification, even where the company has admitted that, well, your password hashes were stolen. They give details about how that hashing works so you can judge for yourself what the likelihood is that the crooks will actually have time to crack your password before you change it. So you can have all that useful information. You think, okay, I'll do it tomorrow. And of course, tomorrow never comes. And so there, there's some shocking statistics of you know, people who about the percentage of people who just don't bother to change your password, even when it would be a minor inconvenience and a major benefit. And of course, we have exactly the same problem, sadly, still with 
convincing people that something like basic two-factor authentication is a good idea. And I think what's happened there is that, you know, the kind of stuff which is, you know, an SMS coming to your phone or one of those apps you use on the phone that, that gives the six-digit codes that come in a 30-second sequence, they're not perfect. They don't solve the problem of phishing at all. They do make it harder for the crooks. In fact, they can make it much harder for the crooks, and they make it a tiny bit less convenient for you. And so a lot of people think, you know, that tiny bit of inconvenience, it's not worth it. And so they use the fact that they have heard of people who were using two-factor authentication and got hacked anyway, which can happen. It's not perfect. But they use that as an excuse to say, you see, might as well not bother. And of course, if that's truly the way you think, then you might as well not have a password at all. And uh, I don't think anyone would quite go that far these days. So I think sometimes we have to, if you like, bite the bullet a little bit ourselves and be prepared to take a little bit of inconvenience for ourselves in order to put a lot of inconvenience in the way of the crooks, because that seems to be a fantastic payoff to us and a, 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 a significant disadvantage to the crooks. And anything we can do to, to keep them further away from us is surely a good thing, not just for us as individuals, but for us as a, as a digital community, a digital society. Our conversation with Paul Ducklin of Sophos continues in the next edition of Mac Voices, where we examine why the decisions you make about security can affect not just you, but those around you. Paul also delivers five tips to help keep you, your security, and maybe even my security just a little bit safer. That's next time on Mac Voices. I hope you'll join us. Until then, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.